can you just say fewer? Because that's that word in and of itself as a modifier indicates the nature of the word that precedes it. In other words, that it's a word that can be counted. So if something is fewer in number, yeah, duh, because everything that's fewer has a number. So in other words, if you have chairs, then you have one chair, two chair, three chairs, you have fewer chairs, et cetera, et cetera. But if it's water, you can't count water. It's not one water, two waters, three waters. So yeah, uh, in view of the fact that, that's what, typically one that you would also uh, since, because, mm. and so, you know, since, we can see this, because this is the case, you don't always have to say in view of the fact that during the time that, while, for the reason that, because, because see, now you're getting there, if conditions are such that, if, if, yeah, you don't always have to say the whole thing, but now I will point out that if you go through this, cognizant of the fact that is, Actually, there's two words for that. You can't use just one. Aware that is what you're, so then you're aware of something. You are aware that something is the case. Obviously. Uh, you could, uh, no, it's not really obviously, um, because cognition is more the idea of awareness. What you're talking about is that something is uh, blatantly true, for example. Mm. By the way, um, a little writing tip. Uh, we were, we were talking in the, in the break uh, about language use and the prudence behind jurisprudence. <laughs> and one of the things I can tell you as a, a, both a writer, a reader, and a former editor, translator, et cetera, be very careful with the word obviously in writing. And the reason for this is it's often a no-win situation because if you say it's obviously and then say something really obvious, it's like you're knowingly wasting the reader's time but if you say obviously and then say something that's really not at all obvious, it's kind of like you're being snooty and you're trying to make your other party sound stupid. And that doesn't work either. There is, however, one case where you can really use obviously, and that comes in very handily for you folks. And that is when you wish to acknowledge a clear and distinct counter argument to whatever you're saying, then you do see that, that you say, Obviously, the first objection that could be put up against this would be to state this. Okay, so uh, cognizant of the fact that has the capacity of is simply if something has the capacity of, then it can, then it is, then it can do something. So then you use a modal you use a modal phrase, and finally, in order to is often simply to. You often don't use in order. But now comes the question. With the exception of uh, things like fewer in number, and I would say despite the fact that, which I just find an ugly kind of uh, extraneous phrase in most cases, many of these things are used and can be used. But then what are you doing? It's what we said before. You're slowing down the reader with purpose. You should use the longer phrase when your whole point is, you want to draw the reader to a halt a little bit. When you want to slow them down, you want to have them thinking about something, pondering it more than you want them to be skimming through it. But in most other cases, so I'm thinking 75% of cases, you want the shorter word. Clarity, brevity, and variety. Keep in mind, so, uh, so there you go. Words have hidden meanings. We just talked about this denotation and connotation. Uh, so as I said, sometimes the meaning of the word is literally one thing, but its value, its emotional value is, somewhat, is something very, very different. Uh, if you look at this, then you have, um, uh, you can think about words like cheap versus inexpensive, for example. If it's an inexpensive hotel, you got a good deal. If it's a cheap hotel, you shouldn't be paying a lot of money. In the one case, it's high value, low cost. In the other case, it's low value, low cost. And that's implicit in what you're saying. Then the lexicon also has all these wonderful words from the law, your own field. Then you get subpoena, felony, estoppel, injunction, tort, 
fiduciary surety tenure, but you also have a whole bunch of others. What else is there? There is the lacking. And now I'm going to tell you something that's going to be highly disillusioning. There are Latinate phrases in pretty much all European legal traditions, but now comes the fun part. They're not all the same. <laughs> One of the ones that I discovered and found very interesting was the fact that while both languages recognize both forms, in Dutch, when you're talking about the principle of you, that you can't reverse legislate against crime. So in other words, you can't have act committed law and then punishment. That's called nulla puna. From nulla puna sine privet legit penale, if I remember my uh, Latin from law correctly. Something like this. The same uh, phrase is in uh, American law as well, but they almost never use it. Generally, they just use the more generic term. They talk about ex post facto laws which is actually in Dutch reserved for pretty much everything that isn't criminal law. So interesting little switching up. You also have terms that are more common in one than in the other. For example, in English law, in re is used and sui generis is often used way more commonly than in, for example, the Netherlands, the only other system that I can compare it with. But for example, I've noticed that terms like uh, mutatis mutandis is used much more frequently by Dutch speakers uh, even writing in English than by English speakers writing in English but this by the same handle. So you have all these nice terms, but they're not necessarily always going to be the same or used with the same frequency. So you have that as well. Then you start getting the really good stuff. Indeed. What did we talk about? Made up terms, the words that come from the literature. Look at the ones that you have in your own. The idiom of the law itself can be quite colorful. An escape clause, run with the land with malice of forethought, the clean hands doctrine, clear and present danger, deep rock doctrine, fruit of the poisonous tree. I've always loved that one. Uh, front end load program and yellow dog contracts. By the way, that's a really obscure one. Does anyone have a clue as to what a yellow dog contract is? It's a contract that says you cannot join a labor union. Oh, well, we don't have dogs. That... And it's illegal in yeah. most places. <laughs> but those in the United States traditionally are called yellow dog contracts. Do not ask me why. That being the case, where does that leave us? And where does that lead us as we roll towards our last coffee break of the day? Well, what did I find in your field? Lexicon of fiscal state aid. Externalities is a word you definitely want to keep abreast of, especially because externalities can mean a lot of different things. Again, there's the multiple levels of meaning here. Externalities in economics are different from externalities in the rest of the world or within other fields of law, et cetera. So keep that in mind. Spillover effects is a great term in the law. It has a very specific meaning. Imperfect information was one. Look at that set of antonyms. Benefits versus distortions. Uh, in some of my other classes, I often do a whole thing on opposites and antonyms. I talk about things like, you have a word like calm. There's like 10 different antonyms for the word calm, depending on what you think calm means. If you think calm has to do with nerves, then you'd say stressed. If you think calm has to do with weather, you'd say stormy. If you think calm has to do with water, you'd say troubled. Benefits can have numerous different in this case, I found a set of antonyms, benefits versus distortions. Mitigate and mitigation, ex ante versus ex post. Discretionary administrative practices. I found that to be incredibly euphemistic. It sounds to me like what you're saying is, well, they have a choice to do something wrong. <laughs> and they're going to do it. No, actually, no, I saw what it was meant to be. But it has a very kind of connotative value. So I thought that was interesting. Derogation was uh, another one that I found their standstill clause. Uh, what's the last one there? Compliance, look at those words. Then as you keep going, what else do you see? 
compatibility, enforcement application, illegality, interest, and freedom of procedure, selectivity versus advantage. That was a weird set. I saw that. I forgot who was talking about that. But I thought that was an interesting way to, um, in a sense, uh, juxtaposition things, to set them up as antonyms. Then, uh, amortization, that's one of those terms that I always have this, uh, I always have this idea that at a certain point it starts to mean things that it's not supposed to. I always have the feeling people are using that too often, but okay, as a technical term. Uh, but Zora's was also there, words made up of other words. Zero interest rate, mandatory convertible loans. Arm's length principle, idiom. BEPS, base erosion and profit shifting. Transfer pricing, all of those things are up there. What else did I find? I found more. Maps. <laughs> Mutual agreement procedures, formulary apportionment, fair and balanced allocation of powers. Keep in mind, that's a sneaky one. It is actually an idiomatic phrase because you're using it with a very specific meaning mind. Subjective versus objective scopes, uh, comp com comparable, see, comparable, uncontrolled price method, remuneration, which is a word I put in there because it infamous, infamously gets misspelled when you're typing yeah. really fast, it comes remuneration. Uh, res judicata, uh, judicata, amicus curiae, uh, knowledge paradox, and mutatis mutandis. As I said, these are some of the things that came up that I would say this is definitely a list that you have to have control of to have control of the material that's being dealt with in this course. But as you add and subtract from the other terms, what you will see is that as you look for, because now here comes the interesting thing, I can give you something as a kind of challenge, something we might come, that might be cool to come back to at a later point, is terms of the law. You all know what these terms mean, generally, at least most of them, and the Latinate terms. But now what I wonder is, could you explain them in English? Something to think about. I'm not going to give you the answer solution yet, but I have it. So I have good definitions of these terms, like one and two sentence definitions. Think about how you would rephrase, repurpose, or reuse those terms if you were talking to someone who did not know what pro bono was, or estoppel, or how to use sui generi, or uh, use tertiary, or any of these terms. Just as an idea, November 17th, when we talk about editing, I'll give you my solutions. All righty. Now, um, just to round off our discussion, uh, this, this first foray into uh, vocabulary, lexicon, terminology, I also have uh, some further uh, uh, things that I wanted to point out to you. Just let me, some words of wisdom, as it says at the top of the, the slide. Uh, keep in mind, uh, watch out for things like informal uh, words or structures. So in that sense, and this comes back very much to um, also what um, was being discussed previously. Watch uh, using, uh, for example, words. Uh, so first of all, no contractions in formal writing. I always tell people this, so things like it's always do not, will not, cannot, not, won't, don't. Can't, you can't do that. Um, so in formal writing, you're supposed to uh, go away from this. Uh, avoid using, I always tell people, avoid using rhetorical questions in argumentative or persuasive writing, <laughs> not in speaking. In speaking, it's brilliant. But my problem with things like rhetorical questions in writing is that you basically you're counting on people then taking a pause before they continue reading to actually before they read your answer. But most people don't do that, so it loses the effect. Uh, let's see what else. Um, avoid idiomatic expressions. So try to avoid things like between the rock and the hard place or uh, any of those kind of things like um, yeah any sayings or kind of. Uh, uh, vernacular phrases, things like that. However, do use the idiomatic terms of the trade. So as we said, arm's length principle, you do use. Uh, spillover uh, effect, you do use. Those are things that are idiomatic to your trade. So the tr fruit of the poison tree, those are basically terminology. So they're not the same thing. 
Um, there you see an example of this uh, is being given. So the first one, the president was given a hard time that you would not do, but fruit of the poison tree, as I said, that's the example I gave, that would be permissible. So watch those kind of things as, uh, as well. What else can I say? Uh, in terms of register, watch out for certain things. Watch for uh, words like um, uh, get, as I said, versus receive, because those get is too broad a word and too vague in that sense. It's all about indeed receive or whatever specific phrase you, 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 you need to use at that moment. Just a second, I just wanna look something up here. Where was I? Here we go. Uh, also, uh, do not use words such as a lot, thing, uh, kind of, etc. But that kind of that in a group like this usually speaks for itself. I don't have to really point those out too much. Uh, don't use inflated language. Keep in mind, even in his most uh, sonorous and verbose, uh, Cardozo doesn't lay down claims that can't be substantiated. And you were talking about that before. But that's also true of hyperbolic uh, language. So, for example, there are an infinite number of definitions of equality. No, there aren't. There are definitely a, a finite number of definitions of equality. It's just perhaps a very large number, but it's not an infinite one. But isn't it? There is an infinite number. Number is Engelfart. Oh, that has to do with something I'm going to come back, I can come back to later. It has to do with something called the proximity rule. And I'll come back to it. It is, there are a number of definitions. But you understand my problem. But I understand your problem, because you're looking for a number, yeah. but it actually refers to number of definitions. And that's, it's a tricky one. I said, I, I can come back to that later. But you're, I definitely see where you're coming from. Uh, try to use, as I said, very few low context or vague words. Remember, good and bad in this context always have to be substantiated. So it has to do with, for example, the, the one that I always give is things like good data. Is Why is it good data? It's because it's reliable data. It's a complete data set. It's evidence would be the same thing. It's solid evidence. Why is it solid evidence? Because it's evidence that can withstand scrutiny, it's evidence that has, has a proper track of provenance, it's evidence that is complete, it's evidence, et cetera, et cetera. Also use interesting and important sparingly. They uh, usually, um, uh, uh, what you're talking about is actually something that's perhaps noteworthy, but uh, has a, some noteworthy value, but is not necessarily uh, particularly fascinating to everyone involved. So in that sense, you have to kind of, what's more important is not so much the value judgment, but logical reasoning. So what you're looking for is not so much that something is of interest or of note, but that it's a necessity, or that it's, uh, for example, that you're looking and saying there's a logical cause and effect, that that's what you're trying to get across. And then you would say, what is, uh, what, uh, then what is noteworthy would be that there's a proper logical connection between something or no proper logical connection between two things. So you'd have to back that up. So in this sense, if you look at this, where it says, in some acts, uh, some words of wisdom, uh, interest and import, import. It is inter important, interesting, necessary to study employer gender prejudices. I would say it is necessary to study this because that's the point. Is it something that isn't just noteworthy? It's something that's essential to our understanding of this certain thing. And that's what's most important. And that can also be a good litmus test for what you put in any writing. Is it really just of interest or is it actually something that needs to be said? Let's see, what else did I want to say in that respect? Uh, however, interestingly, importantly, can be used as sentence adverbs because you're, uh, you are indicating uh, what you're talking about in the sense of if you wish to add a commentary about a certain thing, but then again, 
it should preferably be something that's, for example, counterintuitive. That you're saying, I'm noting this because this doesn't follow the norm. And I believe that that makes it noteworthy or of interest or a necessity to know. So this kind of idea, the data shows that, you know, something that you wouldn't necessarily predict without that data. And then, what else do I have for you? It looks like an eye test, but it is not. Because if you look at the following slides, these aren't meant for projection. These were very much meant for uh, your access. So, uh, in other words, a list of words, what have I given you? One, two, three, four lists, but I said, if you look at them on the screen or in like six in a box kind of thing, it's useless. But if you look at them on Blackboard, what you'll see is it's basically building blocks for writing. These are all what you'd call collocations. In other words, lists of words that go together. And this is great because in the past I've taught courses, for example, in things like creative writing and even fiction, fiction writing. And there I always tell people to abjure the um, cliche, to not use the well-worn path and in my Cardozan uh, 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 prose, to seek out the original, the enticing, the unique. Here, don't do that. There is no need. Embrace the cliches. Use the phrases we all know and are familiar with. It will make your writing easier. It will make our reading easier. So in that sense, what, what legal writing, what research writing, what judicial writing all share in common is an embracing of those very, in, in fact, what seem like cliche phrases but are actually just handy building blocks, collocations of words, words that go together nicely that provide the connective fiber that you need in any good text. And I've given you four pages worth of them. By all means, take a look, embrace them, and use them. That being said, that's what I have to say for today about vocabulary and lexicon. I hope that it has uh, been of some use. As I said, leading from the very broad, the, the lexicon of the language itself, down to the specificity of the words you may need and the choices you will have to make in which ones you need to seek out, which ones you need to use, etc. That being said, I'm left with but one task for today, and that is I wish to explore the future with you. But the future that I wish to explore is future time and expression in English, a first foray. Now, this is noteworthy because anyone who's done a high school program in English has done three distinct things in English once they get to the later stages. You've dealt with what's called future expression in English, so talking about future time. You've dealt with conditional sentences, so those constructions, the if-then construction, and you've talked about something called modal verbs. So those are all of those verbs like can, could, will, would, shall, should, may, might, must, uh, would, rather, had, better, need to, ought to, used to, etc. However, one of the things that high school teachers don't do and can't do is draw them all together. First of all, they don't have the time, and the second reason is they don't really have people in front of them who are going to do writing at that level where it would make sense for all of these things to be brought together. But here we can in, indulge in the subtleties of the future condition and mode. I'm going to start today with the future. We will come back to condition and mode later. But I do want to say one thing about this. Now, as I said, I can't compare to all of the languages in this group because the, the one that I'm truly skilled at outside of English is Dutch. But I can tell you, the Dutch modal use is illustrative of why English is not considered a strong language grammatically. Because in Dutch, all of these things like can, could, will, would, shall, should are way more subtle than they are in English. And one of the reasons why is in Dutch, I actually believe this is also true in German, you have what are called chained modals. In other words, in English, if I wish to express any more than one mode, I have to stop and restart my sentence or create a parallel construction or have a whole new sentence. But in Dutch, you have all these great phrases where you can say, you know, uh, 
uh, had het moeten kunnen weten. You know, I had to, should have, could have known it. But it was still actually grammatically correct language. It was a thing of beauty. In English, you do not have this. And again, that's where translation rears its ugly head. If you think in Dutch, or as I said, to some degree in German, along those lines, and then try to translate, you're going to be in trouble because there's no counterpart in English. You'll have to go to a completely different type of construction. And this field German is, I think, uh, even richer yeah. than Dutch. Yeah, well, and what German has is also has you have this wonderful specificity of all the, uh, uh, what is it, nonvola, the, yeah. well, but the, 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 all the, the subjunctive the, the, genitives and all those things. Yeah. Get, everything changes up as soon as you change that nature of the sentence. That is just brilliant stuff, but hard to learn. <clears throat> I remember that was tough, slut, tough sledding in high school. Of course, it didn't help that I was the only American in my class, so everyone had a Dutch accent, but I had an American accent. My German teacher thought that was hysterically amusing for some reason, but, uh, <laughs> but he was a great guy, so I gave him that one. But, um, so, the future. Okay. Let me ask you a question. Okay, think about this. If I said, I'm going to give you a verb, the verb to meet, to meet, right? Just give me one sentence where you use the verb to meet in a future form. We will meet again. We will meet again, okay? <laughs> yeah, we are on Lancer and Dave Carolyn. We will meet. So, will meet. That's one. Give me another one. We have met. No, nope. that's not a future, that's a present perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to meet. Going to meet, thank you. Yeah. By the way, you're following fantastic, uh, fantastically the, the order. So you first gave me the simple future, will meet. Then you gave me the planned or intended future, I'm going to meet. Give me another one. Will be meeting. I am meeting. I am meeting, very good, and? Will be meeting. Will be meeting. Am meeting is the third form. That's what's called the arranged future. What you gave me was the future progressive. So in other words, the future as it takes place will be meeting at a specific moment in the future. So those are already four really good forms. And I'll point something out to you. That is generally where most people kind of stop. But there are two forms that are really useful in the law that you haven't mentioned. What else can you say? How else can you express something in the future? What? Okay, now you're thinking modally. Oh, so that's a long, oh, that's okay. No, was, <laughs> that's also going to come up, but that's a modal usage. Oh, okay. But very good that you mentioned that. Okay, when, what about this one? We meet on November 17th. And why can I say that in this group? Why can I say we meet on November 17th? Because it has been scheduled. Scheduling in the future actually has its own aspect. So we talk about the scheduled future. And finally, there is, in essence, what you might want to call, it's called, the, I, I term it the mandated future, but you could call it the legal future. We are to meet. And why is that the legal future? Because it's the future that has been, been determined by mandate, by rule. So basically, if we look at this, if we look at the sheets, what do we see? Okay, first of all, I want to show you something. Real quick, a review on tense and aspect. Keep this in mind. If you look where it says a quick reminder on tense, tense and aspect, there are two distinct terms when you're talking about time and language. You have the tenses, past, present, future, and you have the different aspects within those tenses. And all of those things are things like the simple present, the present progressive, the present perfect, the past perfect. All of those things are what we call aspect. And for example, then if you look at this, keep in mind simple, pre simple present and simple past. How does that work? That's everything that is pre permanent, universal, habitual, unchanging, repetition, repetitive, but in the present. So, I am a teacher, it's what I do. 
the law states that you cannot do X without paying Y. Those kind of things. But you cannot do is the thing that's, that's uh, 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 key here. So simple present. Paying is the activity that follows its verbal construction. But okay. So permanent, universal, habitual, unchanging. I am a teacher. This is a university. The sky is, well, I was going to say blue, but <laughs> Great the, the sky is oh. there. How about we just keep it at that? It's been changing all day here. I don't know what it's like in your respective communities, but uh, uh, basically the Dutch weather has been Dutch weather. In other words, about every 10 minutes we get a different season. Um, but if it's permanent, unchanging, simple present, if it's the progressive, past progressive, present progressive, then the idea is it's still in the present, but it's about to change. So for example, with things like if I say, I live in The Hague, that's permanent. That's where I live. I actually do live in The Hague, by the way. Um, but what if I say, I'm living in The Hague? Then what am I actually saying? It's about to change. I'm going to move. So you have to watch those kind of things. Yes, ma'am. Did you have a question? No. Okay. Then, and then of course you also have the present perfect. What are progressives or uh, perfectives? Perfectives are all of those things that start in one time frame and link to another time frame. So if you have the past tense, present tense, future tense, if a if the past is linked to the present, the present is linked to the future, the past is linked to the future through the present, anything like that, that's called a perfective aspect. So the present perfect, I have been a teacher for 27 years. That's saying I started being a teacher in the past. I'm still a teacher in the present. So then I'm using an aspect that links up the two. Those are perfective aspects. So you basically have static aspects present, simple present, present progressive, and you have dynamic aspects, those are the perfectives, where then you're talking about, you're looking at this and you're saying, I'm linking the past to the present, the present to the future, or moments in the past to other moments in the past. He had been a teacher for 25 years when he won the Nobel Prize. One moment late in the past, he was a teacher, started. 25 years later, still in the past, something else happened. You're connecting those two moments in the past. Had been a teacher. That's the past perfect. And in fact, we often call that the present perfect in the past. So you have this interlude of these perfectives. Now, how does this play out for future time and expression? Well, future time has six static aspects. Those are the things we want, just discussed. No perfectives there at all, but it has six forms, not two. The present and the past only have two, simple and progressive. What does the future have? It has the simple future, the planned future, the arranged, the present progressive as a future or arranged future, the future progressive. If there's a future simple, there should be a future progressive. Then the simple present as the scheduled future, and finally, the mandated future. And how does this all play out? Okay, what do you use the simple future for? Well, the simple future is basically what we call neutral use. But what you could call that is the inevitable future. If you wish to express that something by the nature of the passing of time will take place, then you say will plus infinitive. Come next January, I will turn 53. Yeah, I mean, barring anything, yes, ma'am? Oh, barring any untoward circumstance, which we hope will not take place, 53rd birthday is on its way. You can also use this in a modal use, so as a promise, but in terms of time, it's an interesting kind of thing because you also often use, when you're expressing promise, what you're actually talking about is often what we call the immediate future. So things like someone says, I've got a problem, you say, I'll do something about that. Immediate future. I will go into action. Same thing, if someone knocked on that door over there, I would say, 
Stay seated, I'll get it. I will get it, like right now. So I'm gonna act in the immediate future on something. But then, if you look on the slide, and your slide is printed in color, which I don't know that yours are, you'll see red letters. And in the red letters, it says prediction based on prior knowledge. What else do we use the future for? The simple future. We use the simple future to talk about things that we believe, that we, that we conclude, that we find will take place in the future, because of what we know has already gone on in the past. So in other words, this is how scientific prediction works. You look at what's gone before and you project into the future. So if a, if a meteorologist looks at the weather, what do they look at? They look at charts, almanacs, uh, computer programs, the, those, those uh, um, sketchy uh, satellite photos that they always show you on the news and I always wonder why because I'm not a meteorologist I don't read clouds I mean you might as well be showing me an MRI or something but okay um, but the point is they look and they say well tomorrow it will rain because that's a prior determiner they're saying based on what we know this will happen but it could be it could be different Maybe you're using the planned future. And what are you talking about when you do that? The planned future, be going to plus infinitive, I'm going to meet, that's either plan or intention. So indeed, it's just something in my head. I'm basically using aspect in language to project what I have already come to uh, um, well, it compose as an idea. Or, and that's a distinct difference, I can also use this to point out that whatever prediction I'm making is based on present knowledge only. I'm not a meteorologist, but I do have eyes in my head. If I look out the window, I'll say, hmm, gray sky, clouds, wind, you know what? I think it's going to rain. That's a prediction based solely on what I see in front of me. And I can use language to make that distinction clear. So if you wish to isolate your discussion to current knowledge leading to future prediction, use this. If it's based on historical knowledge and deeper insight, use the simple future. But what else do we have? There's also an arranged future. Okay, lawyers, what's the difference between a plan and an arrangement? How many people do you need to make a plan? How many people do you need to make an arrangement? More than more. At least two, yeah. So here, you actually see a social construct being uh, encompassed or being um, in that sense, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Enshrined, as it were, in grammar. Because if I wish to express that something's a plan, I say, I'm going to do it, but that's all about me. But if I say, I am meeting with Carla after class, then you know that I've determined that, and so is she. It's an agreement. So it's basically an arrangement has been made, usually in the short term, and then you use the present progressive, I am meeting with. Excuse me, from Vienna. Sure. Uh, to go back to the future once more, simple future and planned future. Mm -hmm. You gave the example of uh, in January, I think it was, you, you will turn 53, right? That's for the simple future, yes. Yeah, uh, and wouldn't it be possible to say in January you're going to turn 53? Yeah, and I'm going to get back to that because I'm giving you all at the moment, all of the clear definitions is set down in grammar. But the truth is, your question kind of tips my hand, and I'm more than willing to have my hand be tipped at this point. You know what's cool about the future ten tense and aspect thing? I'm going to teach you all the distinctions, and these distinctions are good. And if you use them properly, you'll come across as wickedly precise writers. <laughs> but the downside to this is there's no downside to this because there's an enormous amount of flexibility here. The truth is, 
many people just talk about things like the inevitability as a plan or intention, or they talk about a meeting they're going to have as a plan or intention, or they talk about a plan or intention as if it were an arrangement. Most people aren't as precise in their language use as they should be, and that works to your advantage because that means as you're trying these things out, you're not going to get caught out because the fact is, unless you really make extreme errors, you have a lot of flexibility in using these things. So, uh, but I will point out, it, it would be, the, you'd be a subtle user of the language if you said something like, well, as I will turn 53 next year, I'm planning to organize a big party in February. See, then, or I'm uh, arranging to organize a big party in January. Then you'd have something where you'd say, I'm using both terms of the future to express both the inevitability of the one thing and the arrangement of the other. But as I said, most of the world does not work this way. Okay. So it, but it really is a useful thing to have because one of the things I can tell you is this is a key marker for uh, definitive use of language. And there are a few things that you absolutely have to grasp. And one of them is that, for example, there's flexibility between arrangement plan, plan and simple. But for example, there's no flexibility when it comes to things like uh, mandate. This is to become law on this date. You absolutely have to use that because that's what you're indicating. It's, that it, it's definitely going to be that law on that date. So in that sense, there are a few that are, are fairly definitive, but there are also some gray areas, sure. And I can even point something out to you. If you give me uh, one moment to move forward uh, through these, then I'm going to show you one where you see how people actually are manipulating you using these things. Because here, if you look at this, um, we were talking before, uh, where's my thing? Oh yeah, here we go. Uh, so the arranged future, then if you look at the future progressive, for example, what do you see there? That's ongoing at a defined moment in the future. Again, that's one that you can't really depart from because it is what it says it is. So three weeks from now, I will be flying to Florida. Yeah, that's kind of, you can't say I'm going to be flying to Florida, but that's stylistically a little out there. So, but you can also use this to indicate what's called the normal course of events. Now, what do we mean by that? We talked before about predictions based on prior knowledge, predictions based on present knowledge. You can also have predictions based on norms. In other words, if you assume that everything goes according to a norm, you can make a prediction. Say my, uh, my kid brother who lives in Boston, say he, and is actually a lawyer of all things, uh, if he moved to the Netherlands and he said, I'm moving to Holland and I'm gonna be teaching at your university, I'd say, oh, I'd make all kinds of assumptions. I know what kind of law he's in. I know what his, his interests might be. So I, I know the people who work in the department that his specialty is in. Then I would say, oh, well, if that's the case, you'll, you'll be working with this one and this one. That's the normal course of events. I'm assuming he's in corporate law. He'll go into the corporate law department. In the corporate law department, so-and-so is teaching and doing research. He'll be working with so-and-so. Could be it's completely different. Maybe he says, I've had an epiphany, Mark. I'm no longer in corporate law. I'm doing something with some other field. And I say, okay, that can change. But if we follow the norm, then that's what happens. And now here comes, I'm coming back to uh, the Vienna query here, which actually sounds way heavier if you say it like that. Then it sounds like, like a, a European, you know, like a novel, the Vienna inquiry so by Dan Brown, you know, but, uh, but okay. Um, now, how do people manipulate us? Okay. I'm going to show you something. That's the normal course of events. But what do we see on the next slide? We see here it says the simple present as the scheduled future. Scheduled events, activities, and sequences. Now, if you go to a bus or a train station in the English speaking world, so bus or train station, they announce the coming and going of all the trains and buses using the simple present. So, the, the number 14 inbound bus from Manchester arrives at this and this post in 10 minutes. The outbound train to Chicago leaves the platform in 15 minutes. This one arrives, this one leaves, this one departs, this one enters. It's all in the simple present because what are they doing? They're emphasizing the schedule. 
even if the train is 45 minutes late, they still say, it arrives, it departs, we've got a schedule, we're doing this thing for you. But now go to a plane, now go to an airport. They don't say that. They actually use the future progressive. We'll be arriving in 10 minutes. We'll be departing from this in 20 minutes. They've done research into this. Linguists have done research into this. What they discovered is that at bus stops and train stations, people are obsessed with time. And they, can't, they don't give three things about safety. And trust me, I've been on delayed trains. They really don't care. If uh, we were once stuck just outside of the university, most of the people on board would have voted to just walk along the tracks to get to class, whatever. They care only about the schedule. So everything's expressed in schedule terms, the scheduled future. But people at airports, they want to be on time, but most importantly, they want to be safe. And the normal course of events future is reassuring language. It's like everything is going the way it should, according to norms. The plane will be landing, it won't have an accident, everything will be fine, the people will be safe. We literally get manipulated by this language use. And then finally, as I said, oh, sorry, there is also then the mandated future. And this is very much the last one, but the one you need to remember. This is things that are supposed to happen by decree, protocol, law, mandate. If it has to take place, then you have to use this future. If it has to take place because of an external official authority, making it happen. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is why in many places, emergency instructions are given in the mandated future. In case of emergency, you are to exit the building using the stairs only. You're being ordered by authority to do this. It's a mandate. So, with that in mind, I've given you an overview of, well, a whole bunch of stuff. And among that whole bunch of stuff, vague language intentionally used, what we've discussed is, we talked about working backwards, we talked about future expression, we've done the initial stuff on the uh, initial materials on that, we talked, uh, we did add a first foray into lexicon building, we talked about voice and direction, passive and active, we talked about the modes and the key modes and styles in legal writing and uh, legal expression. So the attic versus the Asiatic. I gave you some principles of communication on the law and communication among the professions in general. There only rests in this respect one thing left for me to do. What any good teacher would do at the end of any session. I got some homework for you. <laughs>